hotel at Atherston. This hotel has stood on this site since the 15th century. And you are here tonight to witness the unveiling of a painting of a person who lived in the 15th century, namely Richard III, King of England. The painting is called Richard in Reflection. And you will see when I go into detail about the painting that there are numerous historical references to his life, locations and events. The theory behind the painting you may have already seen. There are some very, very famous paintings. For example, the portrait of Richard III that have been adopted and altered. The portrait of the princes in the tower sitting on the bed has been adapted. There is a famous painting of Hans by Hans Holbein the Younger, locally known as the Ambassadors, featuring two French ambassadors. And in that painting, Hans Holbein tells a story. We are doing the same with this painting tonight. Another famous painting is the portrait of Sir Thomas More's family, again by Hans Holbein. What we're hoping that you will enjoy tonight is seeing the immense amount of art and work and skill and time that has gone into creating this image. Everyone who has heard about it or seen sketches of it has all gone wow because this picture tells the story not of a snapshot of Richard's life but almost the entirety of his life from the moment of his birth to sadly the moment of his death at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. What we will see is a very detailed painting. You will be surprised not only by the size but by the colour and the content. I will eventually go through with you each of those items but the artist Angie Spencer will also go through her reasonings why she has put some of these items in the painting. The painting is actually going to be going after this unveiling, hopefully, to some very important locations. Negotiations are in place for the painting to go to the King Richard III Museum in Leicester. Then, hopefully, onto the cathedral at Leicester, where Richard III's body is interred. And then, hopefully, to York Minster. We hope that this painting will travel around and people will see and hear the story of Richard, not as the murdering uncle of the princes in the tower, but as a decent man who led a decent life. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce to you Angie Spencer, the artist, but before that, I would like to introduce you to Craig Tracy, the MP for North Warwickshire and Bedworth. Mr Tracy. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much, Eddie, and uh, thank, you, thank you for that introduction. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you all tonight as part of this fantastic event. And I'm sure we all know that Atherston has an abundance of talented people and that's not just now but over the years um, from musicians to uh, writers to artists and it's a pleasure to be here to celebrate the work of yet another tonight Angela Spencer. Now I'm sure everybody here knows Angela and I've known her for a number of years and I knew she had a wealth of talents from being a business owner all-round good person and community champion but I have to say I didn't actually know she was a talented artist and it was only when she actually contacted me to let me know she'd been working in her studio on this celebration to Richard III um, that I was finally lightened to this news and and actually she's just told me interestingly that um, she was an artist from a young age but actually she give up the opportunity to go to art college because she went and joined a rock band instead so uh, I think that tells you probably for those who know Angie that, that is uh, about everything uh, about her but but because of this this new skill I'm excited as anybody to see what is behind this curtain behind us tonight and 
I'm sure as many of us know the local Leicester connection to Richard III um, and it came back to the fore pretty recently when he was found under a car park in that area um, and then it was that which was real tipping point for Angie to uh, engage her fascination in his story and to learn more of his actual past and you will see how much detail she's actually gone into that when this is all unveiled um, but coincidentally uh, she was working at Bosworth Battlefield at the time um, and as well as everything else she does I don't know how she managed to fit that in but obviously it was a perfect place to do just that and to learn about Richard III and his life and that's where her um, spark for this project actually was ignited but it was only when she then started studying at the Attenborough Centre uh, in Leicester de Montfort University that she actually then went on to put at that time pencil to paper because it started as sketch but she started to sketch out um, what would lead to the in culmination of what we're going to see uh, in a few minutes um, today and and so it started from just those few strokes on the uh, on the paper and that just that that curious uh, she was just curious as to what his history was and to put it down um, so before we start the unveiling though I just wanted to touch on the importance of events such as this that we have tonight um, they're important not just to help celebrate the local talent that we have but also to recognize the volunteer community um, because these guys do so much we probably all know them we see them at so many events but they do so much day in day out year year in year out to promote Atherston and the fantastic people that we know live and work here and tonight's event is uh, part of a wider local um, uh, festival of history and um, that's been organised by Eddie here and also in partnership with the Atherston Partnership and of course it wouldn't be an event without Angie being involved in some way shape or form but Angie has also helped in the uh, in the organisation of this event and we're going to there's been 25 events it started last week they're going to finish next week but uh, taking place across the Atherston area and celebrating the profound history that we have here. So I think it's been a fantastic thing. And again, as Eddie said, the ambition is not for this to be the first of the events. We've already got next year's first booking coming through there, I think. Um, but uh, this, um, this is uh, early bird tickets on, on the go. But this is not, you know, not just a one-off event all being well. This is gonna be the first of many, and this will be something that we'll be celebrating in, into the future. But I think tonight, to put that into context, that unveiling such an important piece of work here really underlines the ambition of this event. And I think it's just a perfect way to kick off the, this first festival. Um, and it's the ideal event to also highlight the diverse activities that have been offered on and across the festival. And I'm sure we can all agree that Atherston is a town of great history. We know that. But it's, um, but it's also got a very bright future. And that's something that we should be very proud of and continue to shout about. And I think events like this give us every opportunity to do that. Now, I'm conscious that I am what stands between you and a fantastic piece of art um, and you're dying to see it. So I am gonna bring my remarks to a close there um, because we wanna catch it before it heads off on tour. Uh, very very shortly but before we open it I'd just like to invite to the floor our artist and please give her a very warm welcome Angela Spencer <laughs> you haven't seen it yet <laughs> save your applause no, thank you so very much for coming and a very warm welcome. I feel very privileged and honoured and everything. I'm completely exasperated by the whole experience, including that live performance earlier. It was just dreadful. Um, but um, no, I just want to say a massive thank you for you for, to come out and have a look at this painting. It's taken a staggering 400 hours of my time to actually put this painting together. Ordinarily, artists 
do do their work and then they get out there and start to roll the interest not me i always do everything backwards everything upside and down and i had the date in front of me and started to work towards it very panickingly and uh, so therefore the alarm was set on the clock for 3 a.m every day and it was a marathon of art and then i would go on to work in my tea room and then i'd go back and think i'll nudge a couple of hours in and there'd be no tea on the table and we lived on pot noodle but you know it was worth it and you know i just hope that you do appreciate it the content of it is very personal to me i've followed richard all my life and i do hope you enjoy the painting thank you so very much for coming <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, the painting has been unveiled. I now have the honour, uh, somewhat dubious honour, but honour, of going through the painting and pointing out to you the historical events and icons and symbolism in the painting. First of all, as you take in the size and content of the painting, there are numerous historical references to the life of Richard as a son, a brother, an uncle, a father, a husband, a knight, a duke, and a king. Everything you see before you has a meaning or reference to an event, a person, or a location during his lifetime. Let's start with the frame. The frame is made of English oak, sourced in Leicestershire, made by a local craftsman, Steve Chaplin, during his life, Richard was described by various writers and critics as having a deformed and weak body. This frame seeks to put right that wrongdoing and falsehood. He was strong and stable, able to stand for his beliefs, just like the oak tree. The wood has been treated with a special lacquer, which means there will not be a stain on his character. Between the wooden frame 
and the actual painting, you will see there is a gap, a ridge, a hollow, a gutter. That's done on purpose because throughout his lifetime and since his death, his reputation has been dragged through the gutter. This painting attempts to put those wrongs right. The size of the painting is no accident. <coughs> the height of the canvas is 1,452 millimetres, the year of his birth. The width of the canvas is 1,485 millimetres, the year of his death at Bosworth. The scene in front of you is one where Richard is standing at the entrance to a Burgundian tent looking out towards a castle and the landscape. You will see that on each edge of the tent there are poles supporting the tent and they are draped with the colours of Richard of Murray and Blue. As you can see, with such a large work of art, it is difficult, almost impossible, to take it in in one shot. So the best way of doing this is I'm going to ask you to split the painting into sections. I'd like you to consider the top third of the painting as three separate sections. Top left, top middle, top right. And we then do that with the height of the painting, so we have a top third, a middle third, and a bottom third. So we're splitting it into nine separate sections. So, starting at the top left of the painting, we have some drapes, swags. And on the left, we have the white rose symbolising the dynasty of the York family. Just below the left swag, you can probably pick out there is a sun in splendour, the emblem of Richard's older brother, King Edward IV. That is, beneath, is above a patch of tartan. We know that Richard, fighting and controlling the armies of his brother, fought the Scots at Berwick-on-Tweed, and Berwick-on-Tweed has been English ever since. To the right of the sun in splendour, we have that oak tree, that stability, that strength. To the right of the face of Richard, there is a stag. A stag is a symbol of strength and power, which Richard had, which held. Deer was reserved for the king. He would eat the venison. But he would allow... The rest of the carcass of the animal, including the intestines, which we would call offal, that would be given to the poor people, and they would use it to make pies. Back then, it was called umbles, so they would eat umble pie. <laughs> Moving further to the right, there are two horses grazing next to some shrubs. One of them is a white horse which Richard is supposed to have ridden a white horse called White Surrey. We're now going to move to the middle of the top third of the painting. You will see that above the water is a castle. It is the castle of Midland in Yorkshire. This was the home of King Richard, his wife and his only child. This is where he spent a lot of time before becoming king. To the right of the castle, there are two people by the side of a tree, and they are flying a bird of prey. Those two people are Anne Neville, Richard's wife, and Edward, Prince of Wales, Richard's son. Above the castle, there is the royal standard with fleur-de-lis and lions. And you will notice that the centre of the emblem is pointing directly above the flagpole on the castle, and the castle has a flag at full mast. That would indicate when Richard was in the castle, 
which still continues today with current King Charles when he's at Buckingham Palace, the flag flies at full mast. As we now move across to the right hand side of the top third of the painting, we have another emblem. This is the emblem of the Neville family, Anne Neville, Richard's wife. We're now going to look at the centre section of the paintings, starting with the middle section on the left. Here we have Ch Richard sitting on a chair. On the top of the chair are two finials. In between the finials there's a pointed piece of the chair and that has the letter E on it. And that is to symbolise Edward IV, his late brother, the King. Below it are two roses in, cut into the back of the chair. They represent the two illegitimate children that we know about, John and Catherine. They were born before Richard married Anne Neville. Below those two roses is a lion, and that represents Edward, Prince of Wales. We see Richard looking somewhat thoughtfully and <laughs> pensively out towards the landscape. As you look at him, you will not see from here, but you will later, he has a garter on his leg. He's a knight of the garter, and the wording on the garter is loyalty, because no one could doubt Richard's loyalty to his brother, the King Edward IV, and his motto was loyalty me lie. As we look again, in front of, the ta in front of Richard is a long table. A sign of wealth, a sign of importance. The wider and longer the table, the more important you were. And the table is coloured, covered with a blood red cloth that runs from one side of the painting right through to the other. It has creases and folds. This represents the tragic loss of blood throughout the so-called Wars of the Roses. The loss of life and the blood that flowed throughout those turbulent years. Running along the bottom of the cloth is a little piece of gold thread woven in some sort of pattern. And that represents the plots and plans and conspiracies that weave their way throughout the conflict up until the death of Richard. If we look at the top of the table, there are numerous items relating to Richard's character. To the left, of the table, just to the right of Richard, there is a set of scales. When Richard became king, he altered the justice system to make it more fair for his people. He introduced a form of bail so that people weren't locked up for years on end. As a retired policeman, I'll never forgive him for that, but never mind. <laughs> Next to the scales, Serenely drifting on the water are two swans. Swans mate for life. Richard married Anne Neville. Mated for life. Next to the shrubs with the horses, Angela has painted some bulrushes at the edge of the water. The bulrushes represent... Edmund, uh, Duke of Rutland, who was sadly killed. Rutland is the smallest county in the country, but it's famous for its large expanse of water, which Angela is included in that. Back to the tabletop, and we now look next to the set of scales, is Richard's prayer book. He was well known as being a religious person. And he carried his book of hours with him, and he was well read. It's a sign of piety. Moving along again, next to the book of hours, we have a loaf of bread and a platter 
with some fish. As you know, feeding the 5,000 reference in the Bible, Richard would have used those, but also on the excavation of his body and examination of his lifestyle, Richard did eat a lot of fish. Moving along again, we come to a candlestick. The candlestick is a tall candlestick, a long burning candle, been there for many years. <coughs> that represents the rule of the Plantagenet dynasty, dynasty that ruled for over 300 years. Moving to this section of the painting in the middle and the, towards the right, we have a platter, copper platter, on which is a jug and some goblets. Again, religious references because you would have wine at communion. Moving across, there is fresh fruit as well, but moving across, we have a cushion resting on the top of the table. <coughs> on top of the cushion is a crown. It has been removed from Richard's head and his helmet because it shows that actually throughout his, some of his reign there were moments of peace. It was not always battles. I want you to look at the edge of the cushion. There is a strip of embroidered ribbon. One of the things that Richard did when he became king to preserve the lace and ribbon industries in this country, he banned imports of lace and ribbon from abroad. He didn't want these cheap imports ruining. Almost the first Brexiteer. <laughs> <laughs> On the far right, there is a cascading set of three different roses. The three roses represent the three siblings of Richard. Edward, Edmund, and George. We now move across to the bottom left of the portrait. And in the bottom left, we can see that there is some ivy cascading down. Ivy is an evergreen. It signifies life. In Greek culture, ivy signifies fidelity which we know Richard was. It signifies eternity and faithfulness. All of those characteristics were Richard's. Next to the ivy is a Leicestershire lamb. The woolen industry was so important to this country. England had the finest wool. And to protect it, certain laws were passed. If Richard had died a normal, natural death, he would have been buried in a shroud made of English wool. If you weren't, you would be fined. It was a way of keeping the woolen industry going. Leicestershire lamb, because of what happened subsequently to it. Just below the lamb is a toad. Angela's painted a toad there because it represents transformation and change, especially for those who've gone through difficult times or are experiencing a period of transition. Richard experienced transforming from a young sibling with little or no prospect of becoming a king to ending up ruling the country and caring for his subjects. At the bottom of this segment, lying in the grass, you can just see part of a lance. On the handle of the lance, is the another emblem of the sun in splendour. You will see later in the segments that the lance is broken. I'll come on to that later. So, we want to move to the middle section of the bottom of the painting. Here we see the bodies of a dog, a peacock and a heron, as well as a helmet minus the crown. Next to the fox, the animal represents Leicestershire. Richard lost his life in Leicestershire. The fox is a symbol of Leicestershire and it would have been an animal that would have been hunted. So, moving across. 
Have I got the right page, Bevan? Yep. Because it's a ferocious animal that knows no fear. Very dangerous animal to hunt. And we white, because white is better than evil. The peacock is an animal that would have been preserved for nobility to eat. A lovely, colourful, strident animal. Next to it is a heron. Herons, as you know, hover around. They circle around trying to steal things, including other people's fish. Next to the heron is a wheat, sheaf of wheat because the country had to keep growing and eating and feeding its men. Richard was responsible for looking after his nation. Below the weave sheaf is a barrel. Sadly, the barrel signifies the story about the Duke of Clarence, brother of Richard, who was executed after being accused of treason by Edward IV, and the story is that he was executed by being drowned in a vat of Malmsey wine. The lance running along the bottom signifies that Richard carried the lance for his brother, Edward IV. Richard supported his brother in all his battles. He even commanded some of his army. When you get closer to the painting, you'll see that the lance is actually broken. The grass is hiding that break because they don't want it to make it known publicly about the death. They want to keep the secret quiet. The lance is significant because Richard, in the accounts of the Battle of Bosworth, charged fearlessly into the battle, carrying a lance, and he killed Henry Tudor's standard bearer, a man called William Brandon. Stabbed him, ran him through like a kebab. Sadly, the point on the lance goes towards the right-hand corner. Standing in the bottom right-hand corner is a mirror. The frame of the mirror is made of Gloucester stone. He was, after all, before he came king, Duke of Gloucester. And the image in the mirror is of a younger Richard, a fighting man. Wearing his, helm, wearing his hat with the stone of Midlam on the hat and he's dressed in his harness of armour ready to do battle. Sadly, as we know, Richard lost his life at the Battle of Bosworth. But according to all the accounts, even those who hated Richard, they all stated that Richard died valiantly, fighting in the thickest press of his enemies. So that, ladies and gentlemen, that painting tells a story. You will all have paintings or pictures at home. And you look at that painting or picture and you will immediately have memories of where that was, who was on it. You may even have old paintings and pictures from relatives who have actually written on the back, say in Blackpool 1956, Art Maud or whatever. All I would urge you to do if you use digital photographs today is that you occasionally print one out and write on the back because every picture tells a story. Thank you. I've got absolutely nothing to say. What a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> what a shocker. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Eddie. Obviously, he's explained the in-depth story behind most of the objects that you see on the painting and the historical value of it. Um, obviously, it's an imaginative piece. We sat in a pub over a doom bar in a March windy day, and we had a conflab about doing some heritage work in the community. And that's when the idea of the painting was spawned. And I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to contribute. I'm going to paint a picture of my beloved Richard III. Well, why don't you then? I said, I will. <laughs> so I set to, and I'll go and get the book. Bear with me. <laughs> As I will demonstrate. 
So, I'd got a notebook, because I thought we was talking about agendas and meetings, like we always do. And Mr Smallwood said, well, why don't you scribble it out then? I said, well, what a jolly good idea. So the biro went to task, and that was it. The preparatory drawing of the first image of this painting. There's been a lot changed, there's been a lot interfered with, there's been a lot removed, but the bare bones of it started in my little notebook of hours of what I was going to do to conquer this beautiful little town uh, to sort of encourage heritage in its, in its hub. So then from that, I went to my beloved um, Ashenborough Art Centre over at De Montfort University in Leicester, and I was on a botanical class of art. And obviously, I was painting peacock feathers and flowers and begonias and all the things I should have been painting. And my teacher, Georgia Danvers, who is sadly not with us tonight, looked upon me in despair as she leant over with my giggly art mate, Joe. And we sat like naughty teenagers in the corner, giggling over our pieces. Joe, completely undisciplined as an artist, decided to do abstract. Her petals looked like basically the continent of Africa. <laughs> and we made the teacher despair. She came over and she says, what are you pair chuckling at? And I said, look, Georgia, you've got to listen to me. I'm on a mission and it's called Richard <laughs> and I'm going to do a painting of him. Oh, well, that's interesting, but you're supposed to be painting a tiger lily. I said, well, can you just bear with me because I really do need to finish this helmet. <laughs> so with that then, in despair, she went, I'm going to leave you to it because you're just nothing but a loose cannon. I said, well, funnily enough, they were invented back then. <laughs> so she inspired me to draw a cannon, but I didn't put it in the painting in the end. And then it went from the preparatory drawings to the very, very scary order of the large canvas, which was, as Eddie's explained to you, 1,452 by 1,485. And the guy over the phone says, what on earth? <laughs> I says, look, trust me, I know what I'm doing. You'll be surprised. So he made me the canvas, a guy in Birmingham, and I went and collected it on a windy day and we loaded it into the van and the canvas nearly took off and I thought I was Dorothy. But you know what? We got it home. And then I had a nice gentleman that made me the actual easel that was going to sit for the canvas because obviously leaning against a wall, what does it do? A canvas wobbles. So I can't have wobble when I'm doing my King Richard. So uh, we set to and I paid for him to make this fabulous large easel that was going to accommodate this huge canvas. And then it happened for six weeks... I'd go into my studio at home. I'd go in all hurriedly and excitedly with my brushes. No, I can't do it. <laughs> and I'd run back out. And then I decided to brush the cobwebs off, literally, because in botanical art, ladies and gentlemen, your discipline is watercolour, not oils. And Georgia had no knowledge of oils, and it had been an astonishing 40 years since I'd touched the things. So... I thought, right, I need a teacher. So I set to and I phoned a lady called Lauren, who was an art teacher, stroke oil paint and acrylic artist, phenomenal artist. I knocked on her door in Staunton Herald with my apple and a box of paints. And I said, do you want to see what I'm going to do? She says, no, get up the stairs. So I went up the stairs and she got me to paint a subject. Nothing to do with my beloved Richard. I was in despair. I spent six hours under her discipline and painted a pheasant called Percy. <laughs> but, however, this pheasant turned out to be pretty good and I was quite impressed with my little self. So I thought, oh, I am going to be able to get back there and paint Richard. So I went and got my brushes, my palette, and I thought, right. And she did say to me, if you think this was March the uh, May the 5th, and she did say to me, when's the painting got to be finished by? I said, it's got to be dried and it's got to be ready for the 21st of September. Not a chance, she said. You're going to have to do it in acrylics. Well, if anybody does know me, <laughs> you don't say not a chance, do you, Lorna? I went, do you know what not a chance is? It's a chance. So I got back home, stared at this glarish big white canvas again. And the next thing what you have to do is you have to colour it in. And I thought, I can't do it. So I phoned her up and I said, I can't do it, I'm wimping. So she came out, she found the house, brought the paints, she brought the acrylics, and she went, now get to and do it. 
I says, right, okay, any projectors? No, do it by hand. I went, right, okay, I'm going in. So I did. I picked up my favourite HB, got the image, and I drew it out. Freelance. How stupid and crazy was that? But I did it. And it's all about self-satisfaction, girls and boys. When you do something from scratch, you appreciate things so much more from the heart. So I drew it, and then I was rather pleased with it, and she left me. So then we had to block out the canvas again. It's called blocking out in technical terms if you're an artist, and it had to have colour. So what I did was I blocked out the blue, blocked out the green. Suddenly, I had a landscape forming. The hills were blue and distant in her indigo glare, and I loved it. And I said, suddenly, we've got distance. That's crazy. Keep on going, she says. I'm not leaving till you get to the bottom. Great. So after a pork pie and a sausage roll and a talk over menopause, we got back to the story and we did it. And then she left me and she says, two weeks, I'm coming back because you haven't got long. So with that then, I hated acrylics. I completely cheated and went behind her back and went to Hobbycraft and bought me the new selection of Windsor & Newton's oil paints. But then I thought I was going along with the discipline because the oil paints could be mixed with water. So I thought, well, that's not cheating. It's the same principle. I'm happy with that. So I took the paints home. They were glarish, they were bright, they were mean, they wouldn't mix. And I thought, right. So you use a medium to mix the oils with. And suddenly you get this flexibility and the colours start to come vibrant. And the durability through the brush the magic actually started to happen. And then, excitedly, after a month, I braved it and said to Eddie, look at this! <laughs> Showed him a picture of it. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's not bad. And I realised it was actually the end of June. And I thought, actually, there's no detail. There's no subject matter hardly been painted. And I don't want to paint his face. So I thought, right, OK, come on, Duke of Gloucester. You're going in first, mate. So I took a deep breath, had a slurp of wine, went in with my brush, and I went, come on, Duke, talk to me. And I'd got Alexa on the, on, the, on the playlist, and I literally didn't breathe for two hours. I went blue, and I painted the Duke of Gloucester's face. But then suddenly my son came round, and he went, do you know, said, that's bloody good. That looks like a face. I thought, well, actually, I'd have been happier if you'd have actually said, gosh, doesn't that look like Richard III? But um, you know what? It was, I was happy with the face. Um, and then it carried on, and then it just started to build up. But then I had a problem. I had a really major problem. I had no light direction. And if any of you are budding artists out there, which I'm sure some of you are, and you all know what I'm talking about, you can't paint a painting without light direction. So do you know what I did? I said, right, and we're going on location. Poor Gary, poor Ben. I said, we need photographs and we need to dress up. So this was a result of it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we went on location to Atherston and a beautiful location and I needed a dark lake. I hadn't planned a dark lake, I just wanted one. So I went and found one, sat everybody in fancy dress got the photographs, dressed up as Anne Neville, there I was, boom. And then suddenly I had my light direction and we went, before we did this, I dragged Carol with me, we went round the country buying bits and pieces of ornaments that was relevant to the painting and I had to try and get it as near to my sketches as I could. So I even went as far as Lincoln for the Scales of Justice, where an excited student came running out from the university campus and he said, is this going to be a big painting then? Am I going to be part of it? I says, you bet, pal. <laughs> anyway, so he's going to go to the, he's actually been in contact, he's emailed me, and he's coming to the Richard III Museum in Leicester to see his scales. <laughs> so I think that's absolutely brilliant. And to be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, the painting has just really sort of spored from that. And days and nights, running out of time, massive enthusiasm, setting the alarm at three, running down the stairs, shoving the music on, getting the brushes out, and I was like, oh, I've got this. I've got this, pal. And I just kept going. I just kept going. I didn't give in. 
But I have to say, you know, when you are doing a commission or you're doing something like this, have the sanity to plan further on your field. <laughs> not, not, not three months. Don't do it. But um, anyway, I do hope you like it. And to be honest, I could have put a little bit more detail into it because I just love my detail, but that's my botanical training coming in. And you know what? There's a few personal little suggestions in that painting. Not historical reference like Eddie's explained. One is my horse is in that painting called Barley. There he is. Grazing along there with White Surrey. And then we've got the two roses, the phineas in the, pe in, the, in the chair and a lion underneath. Well, fortunately, I had a little boy born to me. My first grandson was born in August, uh, July, uh, sorry, July 27th. And he, he was supposed to be born in August. Uh, see how mixed up I am, this is what the painting's done. And to be honest with you, you know, he's a Leo. So I thought, he's going to be my lion in my chair. And these two are my two sons. They're my two sons of York. And, you know, the painting just replicates and resonates lots of different meanings for me personally, which I'm going to put in a book. So I started writing the book, and the book is about the painting. <laughs> yes, it is. I've started writing it. And I have to say to you, you know, it's going to be, yes, it's going to be quite, it's called An Artist's Impression. So that's going to be my book. And it's, it started, so I'll, let you, I'll keep you posted on that. Christmas, yes. <laughs> Nothing like giving me a bit of time, is there? And to be honest, you know, I just want to say thank the um, sort of people that came along and provided bits and photo shoots and all the things that we had to do to try and piece together this jigsaw puzzle. But I have to say to you, it was a very emotional day by the late that day <laughs> when suddenly, out of your imagination, <coughs> became reality. And reality is tangibly touchable. And it was very scary, girls and boys. And I thought, my God, my brain is exposed. And there was Eddie sat there with his cloak on. Yes, dutifully with his hat. And, you know, and I have to say, lots of tea and biscuits were supplied from Abbey Farm. And, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just... But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to shut up. And I just want to say a massive thank you to everybody for coming. And my staff, <laughs> I am sorry, <laughs> the tea room went under... <laughs> a degree of sort of, well, it, pressure. For the last three weeks, I had to pull off the runway, said to the boys and girls, crack on. I lost my beloved saddlery through this journey. I've had some very dark moments. I've had some very low moments. Mm -hmm. But this painting has saved me in more ways than one. And I hope its journey continues and inspires other students to get that brush out. And so what I'm going to do, when this goes on tour, it's actually going to be charged a pound an entry to come and see it if anybody's prepared to. <laughs> and you know what we're going to do with that pennies? We're going to put it in a pot and we're going to get a little bit of a fund going for students who've got no pennies so I can make sure they've got some materials in their box to go to college with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a big, big thank you to Dominic. Come up, Dominic. <laughs> Right, this is our other Richard III. <laughs> Dominic was actually the body double for Channel 4's Richard III experiment. He has scoliosis of the spine, exactly the same spinal column as Richard. And so Channel 4 put him to the paces to actually get him to see if he could ride a horse. Well, of course he could ride a horse. Of course he was valiant. How would he have achieved what he'd done if he couldn't have done it? So, Dominic... Thank you so much for coming out tonight and regaling the group with your outfit and the way that you are. And, and another big thank you is obviously to this guy here who has pushed, driven me mad, <laughs> encouraged me, enthusiasm coming out of his temples and going, you can do this. Shut up, Smallwood, I'd say. Leave me alone. And that's how it went. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for coming. And I do want you to come up See the painting, you're going to have some food now and uh, I'll be happy to chat to you behind the scenes. Come and try the frock on and um, come and have a look at the paints, come and look at the brushes and see what we do. All right, thank you so very much.